And now for tonight's talk, I'd like to introduce Dr. William Taylor, who will in introduce tonight's present presentation and who will manage the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Dr. Taylor is an assistant professor in anthropology of anthropology and curator of archaeology at the CU Museum of Natural History. Will, please take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you so much. Um, to everyone for taking time out of your evening to join us. Um, it is my absolute pleasure uh, to welcome here tonight uh, Mr. Christopher Chavez. Uh, Mr. Chavez is a researcher, a tribal historian, and tribal historic preservation officer for the Pueblo of Santo Domingo in New Mexico, in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, in addition to his lifetime of experience with horses, um, He's one of the most educated people that I know. He holds um, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in American studies from the University of New Mexico. He's right in the middle of pursuing um, at least one or perhaps two more uh, additional graduate degrees. Um, so um, he's a lifelong scholar, a lifelong learner, and um, is here joining us tonight to share um, some of his uh, perspective on the role of horses in Pueblo history and Pueblo culture. So, without further ado, um, please uh, give a warm welcome and your time and attention to Mr. Chavez, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy tonight's program. As you go along through the talk, uh, please go ahead and drop any questions that might arise into the Q&A, and then at the end of the talk, we'll have um, hopefully plenty of time for a nice um, question and answer session. So, okay, Mr. Chavez. Thank you, uh, William Taylor. Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm happy to see that uh, I've been anxious all week to make this presentation, but as far as, far as I'm concerned, the Pueblo horses were never mentioned in any archeological uh, research papers, the uh, Plains Indians, the Comanches, the uh, Kiowas and Navajos and um, other tribes were actually using horses for warfare, but not in the Southwest Pueblos, especially in Santo Domingo, uh, upon the uh, initial contact with the Spanish and this is what happened when, when they first saw the horses. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, <clears throat> when the, the horse, the awesome horse that arrived with the strange people, this was the event of a lifetime when the animal with six legs, huge shiny head came upon the Pueblo people of the Southwest. And this animal was breathing smoke and fire along with thunder and lightning and strange noises. The Pueblo people were struck with terrible thoughts and fears for their lives. What will this animal do to us? Should we ask for its good nature and perhaps it will not hurt us? Next slide. The character of the horse was the initial image became a lesser degree of scary thing as the people realized the animal only had four legs metal shield on the head, smoke and thunder came from another source, and the noise was its own voice. And the people realized it was a gentle animal, much like a dog. It needed affection and loving care. This animal was not like the strange man who was cruel, mean, and brutal towards the people. Next slide. <clears throat> The animal as a functional creature, this animal could perform many tasks the owner would ask of the horse. The Pueblo people saw and respected the horse in all its manners and gentle attitude. The animal could pull heavy things, pull wagons, plows, and other work functions. This animal could be ridden for pleasure or work or herding cattle and other horses. <clears throat> Next. And the adoption into Pueblo community as members. When a horse is born, the Pueblo community will immediately honor it by presenting it to the son and giving it a clan and a Pueblo name. 
And then there would be two names, one Pueblo name and a Spanish name. The Spanish name would be celebrated during Spanish church days, like Santiago and San Diego, and other Spanish saints. And the Pueblo name would be recognized as honor and respect among the people and well known. Next slide. In the ceremonial in Pueblo culture, the horse is much adored and worshiped that it is painted on the front of the church for all to see. The horse is also used in certain games that was introduced by the Spanish. Next slide. The horse in agriculture. Before the horse came, labor and planting was tedious and hard work. The horse became the main animal to plow and, the clean, and clean the fields of crops. Next slide. And the oral stories of the Pueblo horse there are numerous heroic stories that the horses performed, staying with the rider when he got thrown or hurt, which was one case. Uh, dancing in honor of the horse. At certain times of the year, the Pueblos honor the horse by dancing the horse dance. There are many variations of the horse dance, which is intriguing and beautiful itself. Next. And the burial of horses in Pueblo culture. Since the birth, the horse is honored throughout its life. The horse is well fed and well groomed, to say the least. And they have the freedom to roam in the, in the village and the, and the reservation. Next slide. At old age, the horse is put out to pasture and let it live out, out the life. Upon its end of life, the horse is taken to a burial site and buried with full Pueblo honors. Next slide. And the Pueblo horse is here to stay with the people. There have been many other animals and birds to be honored by the Pueblos. The parrot, the buffalo, the deer, mountain lion, rabbit, antelope, eagle, hawk, and others with much the same honors as the horse. Next slide. And thank you for listening. This is a story from a Pueblo man who was raised on a reservation and learned to work with the horses. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. So um, we're going to have two different ways that you can ask the question tonight, um, because I think this Q&A will be one of the most useful uh, parts of, of tonight's event. Uh, First, if you, if you prefer, you can type a question into the chat where it says Q&A. Um, if you prefer to ask it directly, it also looks like you should be able to ask that by using um, the raise hand function. If you can raise your hand, um, then I, I will sort of uh, ultimately call on you and it should allow you to talk and, and ask your question directly. Uh, before we go to, to Q&A though, uh, I know that Mr. Chavez, you mentioned that um, you also written down a couple of additional notes that you wanted to have some time to share before we um, moved on to the questions. So um, you can go ahead and, and um, share share that now. Okay. The first one I have is uh, the Pueblo people know that the horse is a cloud symbol, a thunder, lightning, wind, and rain from its sweat when it when he runs and exercises it sweats that's a symbol of rain and uh it's involved with the uh, loud uh, thunder noises and the second one i have it roams our pueblos free and the community owns the horses no no uh uh specific individual owns it if you if you want to ride it it's free for you to ride it or work it you can work it and the third one i say is that uh, the spanish had a horse a gray horse and it was the horse that wasn't galvanized or it wasn't gelded and it was an aggressive horse so the pueblos stayed away from the gray horses because it was so aggressive it would trample people and jump over things that uh you know a very aggressive horse and then the third fourth one is that 
there is no research on any of these things that I'm talking about. Uh, there's a lot of research on Apaches, the Comanches, the Navajos, and the Plains people. They all used the horse for warfare, but not the Pueblos. They used them for agriculture and heavy work. And the last one I have, um, if anybody has any information consider, concerning Pueblo horses in literature, and if, if you can uh, give me the information so I can look it up again. I've looked all over the place for doing this uh, project and I couldn't find any particular ones except for a few uh, anthropologists that interpreted the uh, the uh, horse dance and uh, which wasn't a very, a very uh, nice uh, description of the of the situation that they described. So that's what I had to add to this uh, story. Okay, well, um, I think we should now be able to open it up to questions. And I have uh, quite a few different questions ready in. Um, in case that it takes a minute for them to come in, but it looks like we have a few in our um, starting to come in our chat. Um, Dr. Dimwoody asks, did the people of Santo Domingo name horses? And if so, uh, are there conventions for naming horses? Yes, I, uh, Dr. Dimwoody, I did mention that uh, the horses at birth were given up to the sun by the people, the clan that was uh, transcribed to do that, and they gave it a, a native name, a Pueblo name, and they also included them into the clanship of that particular group of people. And then after that, it was baptized through the church, but it wasn't taken to the church, it was baptized right there by the sacristan who uh, presides over the village and not to, he's not the real priest, but he is authorized to do that. So that that position is uh, very unique. It's recognized as a as a member of the community. The horses are all family, one community. Um, so until other questions come in, I will start asking some of my questions. If that's all right. Um, one of the uh, things you mentioned in your talk that I'd like to hear a little bit more about, if you could. You mentioned um, the idea of some games related to horses that uh, maybe began uh, directly from the Spanish. Could you talk a little bit more about what those games are like? Yes, the particular one is a, uh, a challenge to the Pueblo men that they couldn't ride horses and take a chicken home. It was called in Spanish gallo, which means uh, chicken pool. And we still practice it and since, ever since uh, the Spanish have given up, they don't practice that anymore. But we, we as a community along the Pueblos, we all, pra we all ride our horses and the, you're given this chicken to take home but there are 200 other men who want it. So you had to whip the other person to get it back to your house. And by the time you get it back, it's all in, the, uh, all the feathers are gone. And so you, as a brave man, after the game, your wife or your mother or your sister, they cook it up for you and you eat it. That is a sign of being a, a man, a brave man who rode into the, into the, the, the ground of the other horses. And so it's a game of uh, strength, courage, and bravery. And it's also as a connotation of creating clouds to create rain, which is the ultimate idea in the Southwest where there's no rain, there's no uh, moisture. It's, as you all know, is zero uh, uh, humidity sometimes. and that is the most vital thing that we do is we pray for rain, no matter when and where, everywhere. So. Okay, so we have a lot of questions coming in now. We'll try to get to them uh, one at a time here. First, uh, 
the question comes in from Elizabeth Fenn who asks, uh, who's responsible for tending herds and for <coughs> feeding in the winter? Um, and what are women's interactions with horses? Okay, the first question is uh, the men of the village. We have eight organizations, the north side, east side, south side, west side, middle, and uh, several others. And each week we are from Sunday to Sunday, we are given the authority to, to take care of the horses and we feed them and we give them water and we, and we stay out there in the, in the, in the fields and the mountain in the hills. And uh, we, we also in the evenings practice singing songs and dances. So when we hand over the horses to the next group, we come home on a Sunday and Monday we have a dance. Uh, my particular uh, group is a uh, the middle middle horsemen. We dance uh, the Tewa harvest dance, and uh, that's our specialty. We dance that, and other other uh, groups they they also dance that. As far as women are concerned, they can pet them, feed them, but um, for some reason they they're allowed to ride them, but they don't. You know, my sister does. She's a cowgirl. She's a, uh, she rides pretty hard, but others, they, they ready to stay away from the horses. They, they uh, brush them down, water them and stuff like that. But other than that, they don't participate in these horse riding and racing. The next question that's come in asks, uh, what does it mean to baptize the horse? Is it similar? Uh, to the baptism for a human, does it is it involve sprinkling water or, or immersion in water, or could you talk more about that? Well, the uh, sacristan comes over and he carries a uh, little pottery with a little brush and he blesses the horse. And it's considered to be part of our community as a human being, as a, as a non-speaking uh, person but we honor them in that way and then the christian church also mentions that that we we believe in these animals and there's a saint anthony he's the patron saint for all animals and when when his birthday comes up when the celebration comes up we bring the horses into the churchyard on the, on the south side and they get blessed again so that's a connection with the uh, Roman Catholic Church. They are very prim permissive in accepting animals in the, into their uh, church. That's why you saw that my the church, the front of my church, they have two horses. Inside the church, if you ever come to visit, you will see statues of horses on the windows and some horses on the uh, altar where, where the saints are all sitting there. So they're included in the, within the community. So the next question is about buying and selling horses. And uh, the question is, were the people of Santo Domingo in the, presumably in the past when, in, um, you know, when Spanish had horses were, were uh, the people of the Pueblo involved in buying or selling of the horses, uh, trading them other places? You can, the Spanish would uh, sell the horses to us, but we never sold them back because we honor them. Once they come into the, into the village, into our community, they become one of us. So we don't sell them back. And so they pass on of old age and we keep them here. We don't, we don't trade or uh, we give them as gifts to other, other men in honor of if a person doesn't have a horse or the horse, their horse dies and you have two or three and you gladly take one of them and give it to him in honor of his friendship with you. And that way it's a community of uh, horsemen. 
The next question is about uh, horse burials. When a horse dies, would you uh, be willing to describe more about uh, how or where uh, a horse is, is laid to rest when they die? Actually, the, the horse where, where it passes on, right at that location, is where they get buried right there. Uh, with full honors as, as human beings, they get, you know, these uh, spiritual stuff put into, into their graves and for, uh, for their uh, travel back to, 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 to our mother. So that's how it's done. It's a dear buried with four honors. The next question is about the horse dance. The question asks, uh, is it unique to Santo Domingo or is it common to other pueblos as well? And is it something that's private or something that visitors can sometimes uh, view? Well, they're all that in all perspectives. Uh, the Plains Indians and other uh, natives around have horse dances, but in our particular one, we have oh so many of them that uh, we honor the horse as as a character dancer, as part of the dance, or as a, uh, a participant in other forms, that, and where you sing songs of the horse songs, and you also uh, act like horses on, you know, the, your character becomes your, as a horse. So it's, 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 it's very much involved in our ceremonies. So um, there are two questions. One is a comment from Anne, uh, who, who put the name of some uh, literature that you might want to see, uh, a writing called House Made of Dawn by Scott Momaday and uh, Anne put that in the chat so um, we can share that with you after the talk. Yes, I uh, I read that book and uh, I have to say he's not Pueblo. He's Kiowa and he wrote about the Hamas people and the Pueblos. He has secondary knowledge like an anthropologist would, not coming from the community itself. And he talks about horses, but specifically anything that I would consider literature, it's just a secondhand word from Hamas, how the Pueblos conduct their, you know, their horse dances and ceremonies, so. So Anne's next question is about breeding horses. Um, are horses bred for anything in specific, any specific, you know, uh, traits or qualities, uh, or are they more kind of uh, left to, to themselves and their own choices? Uh, if you have a, um, if you want good uh, farming horses, plow and stuff, you breed a specific big heavy set uh, horse to, uh, to, to uh, produce uh, that kind of animal. So we actually practiced genetic, genetic uh, manipulation of horses. If you want a fast horse, you breed the fastest horse you have, and then you turn them into a uh, gallo horse, which is a they can turn in a, in a, on a dime and, and or they can run fast and get away from the other, other horses. So uh, there was no, well, they, there was specific ways of breeding them. If you want to, like I said, a specific, specific type of horse, that's what you breed them for. So the next question is about names. Can you talk a little bit about how people name their horses, uh, maybe some uh, some examples of, of what kind of names a horse might get? Well, in the beginning, they were given um, two names, one coming from the 
uh, Pueblo perspective and another one coming from the Spanish perspective. Just like us, like my name is Cristobo or Christopher, that's a saint's name, but I have an Indian name, Kaisero, which is my specific name in my clanship. So you get the same kind of treatment to the, to the horses. They're given the same kind of uh, names. Uh, if it's a Spanish name, it's usually named as a saint, Saint Dominique or, or, just, or just Dominique or uh, any kind of Diego or Santiago. Santiago is very popular in the, in the Spanish names. Um, and then you get the Indian names and that's the way they, they live out their lives with those kind of names. So the next question, um, what are some of the ways that horses changed life or culture for Pueblo folks uh, after they arrived? Could you repeat that? Yeah, what are, what are some of the most important or significant ways that horses changed culture or changed life for Pueblo people after the, they arrived with the Spanish? They were very much admired as a, as part of a new uh, introduction into our community. Uh, first thing, there was the eagle. It was accepted into the community and the turkey, different animals, different times. They meant something, especially the parrot. At the time of the meeting with the parrots, they came up from the south brought here and you can see the the dances different dances there's parrot feathers we even have parrots here in the village and they're named the same way as the horses given names and so in that way the horses meant a lot to the people they, they accepted them they said welcome you are my brother you are my sister you you are one of us so it in all due respects that mother nature is all of us, you know, so we pray to the horses, we pray to the cows and uh, plants and trees and sun. So that's how we conduct with the horses. <clears throat> the next question is about uh, the Pueblo Revolt. So, uh, and actually I will piggyback a little bit on, on Elizabeth's question. Uh, her, her question is, are there stories about horses related to the Pueblo uprising of 1680. Um, and yeah, I'll let you answer before I see it. Maybe I'll piggyback on that. Okay. In, the, in 1680, the horses were still actually the own, owned by the Spanish people. They were not uh, really letting go of the, the war horses, so, so called the one that, that are not uh, galvanized, uh, but the, the horses were work horses for the farms. And in 1680, there were no horses that uh, the Pueblos rode. And because it would be very visible in, in, the, in the landscape when you, you come upon the, the Spanish, you had to be very sneaky because what you had was bow and arrows and a rabbit club well, they had muskets and uh, autobuses and, and things that could really hurt you or kill you. So the Pueblos only asked for, for the Spanish to go back and leave us alone. And the only people that were uh, actually taken down were the uh, uh, missionaries or the priests who refused to go because they were committed to converting the Pueblo people. And so they were uh, put down and buried into into the churchyards. And so that's that's th those were the only ones that I know of. The Spanish said so many hundred Spanish people were killed. There were there's no list of people that were killed, except uh, uh, Baldassar in uh, Ekema. He was, but that was way way afterwards. But, uh, you know, you can't fight gunpowder with uh, 
bow and arrows. For them. The next question is about the Gaio pull. And uh, the question is, um, it, it seems that there's some people who, who protest this event. Um, <laughs> can, do you have some comment or reaction to that? Uh, yes, I was a uh, tribal official during that time. The uh, uh, human rights or these people that uh, said that we were cruel to the chicken wanted to come down and stop the whole Gaio uh, celebration. So the newspaper, the New Mexican, I think the Albuquerque Journal also published an article that they were coming in to sit in the plaza and stop the whole show. So the tribe, they employed every man, every tribal official to lock down on the uh, entrance to the village. So no, no other person except the local community was permitted to, to uh, attend this celebration. And then there was a uh, news about uh, this situation and somehow we won the case adjudicated that it was more cruel treatment in growing chicken in these hot sweat sweat uh, plantation or animal uh, chicken coops. So there was more cruelty there than it was over here. So that that went away and that was the, the end of that uh, situation. The next question uh, is about gelding, about castration. So um, are, are colts and stallions um, in the Pueblo gelded or is, are all male horses left um, kind of complete? And the second part of the question is how does the uh, management of horses uh, in Santo Domingo compare maybe with the, the approach used by the government, the BLM for managing the, the large, you know, wild herds? Uh, the first, first question, um, if you want to breed uh, a horse that does uh, is is built like a you know um, a, a plow animal, and you wanted that specific type of uh, animal. You didn't fix them; you let them breed. But once that breeding stops, you give that horse to somebody else for their breeding, because you don't want to want them to go in a circle with with their daughters, you know, so uh, you just use them once and then you push, uh, give them to somebody, trade another horse to, uh, to your neighbor or your friend. So that's how it's conducted. Uh, if you wanted a horse to have that physical character or the workable uh, character, then you put them in that, you don't fix them and you, you, you you uh, use them for, for breeding purposes. So the next question is about horse equipment. So uh, the, the question is, do, do or did Pueblo people use Spanish saddles, bridles, bits? Um, or is there, are there kinds of horse equipment that were uh, unique to Pueblo folks? Initially, the uh, saddles were uh, made by the Spaniards, and so it was used. But then came the idea of bareback riding. You just throw a, a robe or, or a blanket over the back, and you, you tie a, a rope around the, the noose, and you ride them that way. You're much braver and you're stronger in that sense. So uh, the, the saddle went away. But most, most of the uh, uh, later on, the, the harnesses 
for the plows and for the uh, wagons and different things uh, were brought in by the American system that introduced the wagon, the plow and other things for the harnesses. So we use those. What about decorations? Uh, De any, any fancy decorations? Oh, decoration is uh, in, a, in a native way. Uh, you just uh, do what you call a hand prints on them and you tie little eagle feathers so they can be light and fast and different things that you do to them to, to make them, you know, beautiful. Uh, Spanish, they, they put in these bridles that were silver laden and, um, but we didn't, we didn't go that direction. We went to the native direction. So I apologize that I think a lot of uh, backlog, there's two different ways that people can ask questions, one in the Q&A and one in the chat. So we have a, a bit of a backlog in the chat. Um, let's see. Uh, the, the next uh, question here, and I'll, I'll pick back through and make sure I don't miss any here. So uh, don't worry if I skip to you. Um, Maggie asked that um, she learned recently about uh, slaughter of Comanche horses by the U.S. Army in the 19th century. Uh, are there, uh, were there also instances where Pueblo horses were slaughtered uh, by U.S. military? Um, do you know anything about uh, that slaughter of Comanche horses? I'm not... Uh... Well, they probably did that with the Comanche horses, but uh, here we protected these horses from being slaughtered. The government did come through to announce that we were we had a, uh, too many horses and that we need to reduce them. So we, we said we will. And so we took some horses on the west side, some horses on the east side and kind of hid them away and uh, they never came in to uh, do any slaughtering here on in Santa Domingo. So you you already a little bit answered this question when we talked about making <clears throat> uh, saddles and harness and, and that sort of thing. But um, the next question is specifically about bits. So when horses arrived, were they also sort of traded in with Spanish bit equipment? Um, or, uh, you know, it were different methods used to, to train and ride a horse um, separate from the Spanish tradition? The Pueblos didn't use those cruel methods of training. I don't know if you have ever looked at the uh, bridles, but they have different designs that can, when you pull on it, it pushes the tongue back or up or sideways and it makes the horse stop and it's torture. The Pueblos used ropes, just just ropes and that was it. There was no, no fancy uh, metal uh, equipment to stop the horses, including the, the uh, spurs. We don't use spurs, that's torture and so we, we never uh, paid it to, I mean, we never accepted those kind of uh, uh, torture devices for the animals. Um, so I guess I will ask since uh, Paul Griffin has had your hands been raised basically the whole talk. I don't know if it was uh, an accident or not, but uh, Paul, did you have a question? I allow you to talk then if you have a question. <laughs> uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but no, I did not have a question. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Paul. Um, all right, the next question is about horseshoes. Um, do Pueblo folks put shoes on their horses? No, that's again torture. They what happens is they they cut the the. Uh, 
the hooves. I mean, they trim them, but they don't uh, put metal uh, nails and shoes on them. It's just a, a method to make them uh, faster and more uh, rock climbers and stuff like that. Just it's not necessary to use those. We don't use them. It's again one of the torture pieces for horses. So uh, I think I have the chance now to ask another question, which is I know that some of your uh, special research, you know, your master's thesis, you, you've also studied a lot on corn and maize and, and the, the importance and uh, significance of corn. I know that talking with you before, you've hinted at maybe a special relationship or connection, right, with with horses and with corn. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about, about that? Well, corn itself and horses are miracles that happen to our communities. So corn is very much honored like the horse. And when you're born, you're given a, a corn and given a name and baptized, same way as the horses are. So corn is essential as much as the horses. It, they sustain us. They, they, they build on our, our pride and they, they give us this uh, food source. Uh, like the corn gives us the food source and the horse supplies us with the, with the work to produce the corn. So there's a connection there. And they also partake of the corn, the horses do. So we all, we're a circle, so to speak. So the next question is about uh, health care and veterinary care of horses. Can you talk about uh, how horses are cared for? You know, is it like regular veterinary care um, or, you know, and is, is there special aspects of, of the care for horses in terms of their health? In the past, uh, the horses were taken care of by the medicine man. And they knew what to do with the horses, just like us. If we got sick, they'll take care of us. Just like when a horse gets sick, they took care of us. But recently, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the federal government said, you need to give them shots, take care of them, give them uh, different uh, examinations. So the tribe said, okay, you know, you can come in. If it doesn't cost us anything, you can examine every one of them if you want. So uh, once a year they come, volunteers, veterans, veterinarians come in and they take a look at the horses. Uh, you see in a, in a picture here, they're pretty healthy. And uh, I recognize the uh, the the last one, the dark one, he's mine, and uh, he's, he's he's I think he's breeding those other mares there. So um, they're pretty healthy initially, and they get fed pretty good. You know. The next question comes from Mika, uh, who's asking about the difference between treatment of horses in the Spanish world versus the Pueblo world. Uh, do you think that? Um, horses were more treated like war uh, machines or objects in the Spanish world and is there uh, more relief uh, from in terms of their relationship with people in the, in the Pueblo world? That's exactly what I'm talking about. The Spanish used the horses for warfare. Well, initially when they came in, they had these monstrous that came through. And then the Pueblos used them for agriculture, for uh, peaceful things. They, the Pueblos are not known for being uh, aggressive warriors out there, uh, raiding, raiding other villages or anything like that. Like the Plains Indians and the Comanches and the Navajos, as I mentioned before, used them for warfare. Not the Pueblos, not us, we didn't uh, we didn't abuse them. Uh, okay, so 
before I ask the next question, I, I want to make sure to ask you a little bit about your horses. Uh, what horses do you have? You, you, you pointed one of them out in the photo. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your personal uh, relationship with horses um, over your life? Well, when I was uh, a child, my grandfather took me out to the cornfields and he would let me ride the plow horse, but he was actually in charge. He had the rein across, across uh, on his back in the plow. And he would say, okay, grandson, turn the horse. And I would pull on the rein and the horse would turn. And I thought I was doing something great, but actually my grandfather was maneuvering the, the reins so that the horse would go. And I was in charge of uh, uh, washing them, giving baths and feeding them. And uh, so I was quite involved with the horses and I would uh, early in the morning, we would uh, put the uh, reins on them and put the hitch up the wagon and go out and spend the whole day and the whole summer in, in the field, you know, working with the horses. I, right now I have eight horses and the one you see there, his name is Joe, <laughs> St. Joseph, you know, we would just call him Joe. Uh, he's not gelded, he's, he's, he's handsome, so I didn't geld him. Um, I have one, his name is uh, Abish, which means surprise. When I got him, it was a surprise to me. A friend of mine gave it to me. And so I gave it to my nephew and he, I said, his name is Surprise, but his uh, Indian name is, uh, you know, Abish, but his, you know, English name is Surprise, is uh, Domingo in, in Spanish. So he had three names. So the other ones are Daisy, uh, Patricia, Sally. Um, what's her, the other one is um, Linda and two more others I can't recall right off. So I have eight horses there. Most of them are mares, very gentle. So the next question is about uh, taking care of the horses. Uh, the question is, they can be kind of uh, expensive. Is it basically uh, an individual responsibility to take care of your own horses or, or does the tribe have uh, some program in place for that as well? Uh, both, actually. If you want to keep your horses in a pasture, you take care of them and you feed them and you water them. But the community actually owns the horses. So that's why I was mentioned the eight eight uh, groups of uh, men who take the horses out on a weekly basis out to the uh, hills and they, they graze them out there. So it's both ways, community and individual. So Anne's asking uh, some a more fun question. Uh, what's your favorite horse that you've had or what's your favorite kind of breed or type of horse she also says that Joe is handsome. She agrees <laughs> and wants to know what you like to do with your horses in terms of uh, riding them or, or spending time with them. I have two. One is a paint. Beautiful. It's called a Tobiano. It's a triple paint. Yes, it's white with black spots and brown spots. And... Uh, He's my favorite. And then I have a, um, <clears throat> a Cadillac of horses. Uh, he's a kind of like a cream color, beautiful. He walks with the, with the suspension that he doesn't, he doesn't rock. He just kind of rolls with the, and you sit and relax. You can fall asleep on that horse. And so I have two horses. The, the first one is very, uh, uh, agile and very fast. The second one is gentle and slow, and that's what I like about him. 
I have a question building off that. You know, some uh, some horses do something that's called ambling, right? It's just, it's a uh, special kind of pace that's much smoother. Are there uh, uh, different kinds of uh, horses in different paces in uh, in your pueblo, and and uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the the one I have. Is very gentle, and I like to ride him on the when I when I go get the cows from the from the hills, because he he doesn't need to get excited. But the other one is just too uh, how do you call it Sp sprite, and he wants to run. So I use him for the gallo, and the other one is for uh, uh, taking care of the cattle and just kind of. Sunday afternoon stroll or ride. So he's much smoother and he's got a gait that's uh, long strides and which makes it a softer ride. The other one is just rough and you, you jump up and down. Uh, has the, the church always been decorated with horses? And yes. What's the, the history of that, uh, of those beautiful panels which were the opening image here in, in in tonight's PowerPoint. Yeah, the, the horse, like like I said, is, is Christianized or baptized and given a, a, a Spanish or English name, and especially saints' names. And the church recognized that. And so when, the, when our community artists uh, put those pictures up, the church accepted that. As a matter of fact, it encouraged it to keep the people coming. You know, like uh, they build these churches on top of sacred places, and so that the people will come in two perspectives the native spiritual moment and the Christian spiritual moment. And you combine those two, and you have a church. It, it happened throughout. The Americas, in Peru, where I was visiting, they took the pyramids, pyramids, and chopped off the top and put a church on there. In the uh, in the village of Cusco, there were eight uh, churches. Each one of them was built on top of it. But here, uh, we have this church that was the third one, and so our people built that church. And we have full authority over it. And the Archbishop of Santa Fe or the Pope has no responsibility to take care of it. We take care of it ourselves. And we just invite the priest to come on Sundays to, to pray and different celebrations. So the church is actually a part of our way of life and, and worshiping of nature itself. There is no disconnect anymore. It's, the church is combined with our spiritual uh, our, uh, being so that people come by and they watch the corn dances. They say, how come you have a saint over here and you're dancing the pagan dance? Think, you know, we all combine to form one uh, universal uh, spiritual ad attitude. I wouldn't say religion, but spiritual attitude. So that's my uh, position on that. We're actually what you call universalist. We worship everything. The trees, the grass, everything, horses, people. We honor people. We honor Mother Nature. Well, I think that uh, we could probably fill like four or five hours here with all the questions because they just <laughs> they keep coming. But I think we have time for one more question here. Um, and the final question is about cattle. Uh, are horses uh, used in relation to raising cattle, roping cattle? Um, and uh, yeah, what, what does a working horse do? Well, we use the, uh, the gentle horses to uh, herd the cattle down. And 
we take care of the, the cows by herding them with this, not pushing them, but just kind of walking them back to the corral for branding, for, for uh, uh, fixing them or whatever we need to do. We don't uh, actually uh, ride them to death at all. Just, we just gently take them back into uh, the corral. There's certain methods we, we tie a, we tie a bale of alfalfa on a rope. We actually let the cows taste it, and then we pull the pull the bale of alfalfa back to the corral, and the, and the cows actually follow. And then when you get to the corral, you loosen up the bale, and then and you throw in some more extra alfalfa for them to eat. So that's we don't push them; we pull them. We don't uh, beat him with uh, any kind of uh, rope or whip or anything like that. But we we do take care of the. So we got a, a couple of uh, very heartfelt messages of thanks uh, toward you in the chat. So make sure to try to read those here uh, before we finish. <laughs> I just want to, um, on behalf of CU Museum, uh, myself, Suzanne, everybody who um, uh, was lucky enough to be a part of this tonight, we really just thank you so much for um, taking the time to share some of your research, <coughs> your knowledge, and um, uh, it's really been an absolute uh, treat. And like I said, I think <laughs> I think we could take uh, from the rate that the questions are coming in, we could probably keep doing this all night, but. Um, in or in interest of keeping it to an hour, um, we'll we'll wrap it up there. But um, a huge thank you. Um, and again, it's the biggest tragedy of these Zoom events is that we can't properly, you know, thank you with a round of applause. But if you would, you know, there is a, a way we can sort of do the digital applause <laughs> um, with your little reaction there. Um, but uh, I I can tell from from the way that everyone has interacted here that. Uh, it would be a resounding round of applause here. So, um, again, thank you so much for for taking the time to be here. I really look forward to our next chat and our next discussion. And um, before everyone leaves here, I can see we're starting to bleed people out the door. I just wanted to scoot. Suzanne, if you could scoot one or two more slides down. Uh, just wanted to point out that Mr. Chavez and Click quick once so it'll play this. Mr. Chavez has actually contributed a short video to our digital exhibit about horses. So if you if you advance that, it should play. Yeah. Um, and you can find that on our website at the CU Museum. Um, and along with uh, some other interesting things like, you know, a couple, some 3D models, some other videos, stories from, from different folks. Uh, so I do encourage you, uh, you all to visit that exhibit that, that Mr. Chavez contributed to. Um, do try to visit us in person as well um, and uh, come see our new exhibit in the building. Our digital stuff is also online there in, in Espanol and Spanish as well. So um, I think that's all I have to say other than uh, once again just um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk, for answering all of our questions and uh, I will look forward to um, to thanking you in person in a couple of weeks um, down in my, my request is that uh, all those questions that uh, we didn't answer, you could probably write them down for me and email it to me and I can- Yeah, can we put your email in the chat as well? Because I know that that's, uh, people might also be, like to email you directly. Yes. Okay, and your email address is? Should I look it up? Yeah, it's it's. Uh... Oh, okay. One moment, and I'll I'll put it in the chat here for those who are who are looking. It. Okay, I have it here. It is. Okay. So that's that's uh, one email address there for Mr. Chavez if you'd like to follow up with him. Uh, questions separately or talk horses or literature or or 
uh, whatever you'd like to talk. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much, and I think we can bring this to a close.